For the 13th Guangzhou Biennale, Minds Rising, Spirits Tuning, Diogo Pussirinho Studio has been commissioned to develop a sonography and a spatial score for more than 50 artists and thinkers throughout a total of four venues spread across the city of Guangzhou. The biennial halls, an area of almost 8,000 square meters, is the largest of the exhibition venues and it treats its five galleries as one continuous narrative that charges the visitors with the sensorial strategies that help them decipher the different themes on display. Imagine now you are entering a temple. We will ask you to take your shoes off, slow down and contemplate the works. The first element we face uh, is a 2.4 meter high black wall, which immediately forces the visitor to make a decision to turn right or left, entering a peripheral circulation. On one side, we see a Korean contemporary artist, and on the other, a series of historical works are being presented. On approach, the only other thing visible is a series of colorful columns, which indicate that there is something inside about to be revealed. Like a treasure chest or a jewelry box, we try to create the notion of a special place inside this first 2,000 square meters white warehouse. We pass the entrance, wall and walk into the space, the, the walls uh, guarding and surrounding the gallery become lower and lower and slowly reveal its true content. The design is reminiscent of courtyards of Korean traditional private homes, the Hanuks, and also the use of height and colors from Buddhist temples. This black peripheral structure is more than a hundred running meters and it functions um, as a seating area. In reality, it is one gigantic so social bench that invites the visitor to sit down and absorb a first glimpse of some of the topics of the Biennale. The bench also offers an opportunity to relax, to play and to socialize. Further on, we have a bookshop and of course, uh, ticketing um, information. And here you can greet uh, many of the monsters and spirits that populate this edition of the Biennale. They welcome you to start the exhibition. And one important thing um, that we have decided is that for the very first time, this ground floor extends free access to all visitors. Moving forward to the second gallery titled Kinship of Mountains, Fields and Rivers. Uh, we introduce the new architectural grammar that has been specifically developed for this edition of the Biennale. We have been able to simultaneously showcase um, colossal installations, but also render intimacy for smaller artworks. And by bringing in an organic way of experiencing the space, uh, we set up constellations and relationships between artists, artworks, um, and also venues since, since this architectural grammar then it's being used later on throughout the city. In this gallery, we encounter a semicircular footprint that it's defined by a variety of these different elements. It is the moment where most of the architectural grammar is fully presented to the visitor. And from, from walls to daybeds, plinths to vitrines, uh, everything has been uh, rethought in a way to suggest an idea of spirituality and unbalance and fragility to its display techniques. This semicircular display of content also help us define a notion of interior and exterior as in the previous gallery, but this time the visitor can trespass it. And more important, it, it, its shape helps to ritualize the works almost in a Stonehenge style approach where artworks become spirits awaiting for the next solstice. It is a ritual that it's about to start uh, where the visitor is found surrounded by this large circle of small structures that are being overlooked by colorful, gigantic statuesque volumes. Moving forward to gallery three titled Bodies in Desire Beyond the Disciplinary Fold. 
um, the visitor is no longer in control of the space. Uh, a maze of tunnels made of various fabrics and transparency, transparencies compartmentalize this uh, gallery in different ways. The level of intimacy is taken to an extreme, not only by the way the visitors discover these rooms and lose each other, but also the way the content is presented to them. In most of these triangular shaped rooms, we have two artists or artworks talking with each other and the visitor becomes the third person that mediates this conversation and dialogue. One crucial aspect about the whole architecture uh, of the Biennale, it is, its, it is its sustainable aspect. For example, in this gallery, 90% of the walls are made of jute, which is a vegetable textile composed of natural fibers. The color palette that we have deployed in this gallery, together with the seductive aspects of the different layers of materials, just to pose an idea of queerness versus military and surveillance aesthetics, which are the main themes of this floor. To correct course and help the visitors find their way out, we also have created what we call a main avenue, which leads directly to an outside bridge and a surrounding park. And for the very first time, um, a gigantic window on the facade has been open and it allows the visitor to experience the park and the outdoors and create a, a needed moment of pause. Moving forward to gallery four, titled Matters of Mutation, and quoting the artistic directors, Daphna Ayas and Natasha Ginvala, the artists on display present a series of mutant beings, both microscopic and colossal, that quickly replace dated concepts of beauty, race, and Western construct, constructs of nature. To reflect this intricate intric topics from a design perspective, we face the visitor with notions of spatial distortion and disorientation. A massive volume is wrongly placed in the gallery and it organizes a new direction of displaying the artworks. This idea is further accentuated by coloring all the existing columns and create a grid-like pattern. By doing this, we introduce a notion of movement within a constricted space where the visitor is released from previous labyrinthic circulations and is welcome to wander around. As in gallery two, this space includes both microscopic and monumental content and works, all of which illustrates the fragility of the current political and economic systems which we are living in. Video and sound are a very important design component of the space. Uh, one thing that it's worth to mention is that the light becomes dimmer and dimmer throughout the galleries. So these two elements, they become uh, very important navigational uh, wayfinding tools for the visitor. Moving forward um, and heading towards the last gallery of this venue titled Matriarchy in Motion. Somehow this is the culmination of the journey that it's presented in this venue. And in a very abstract way, what the studio tries to do is to reference the lower levels of a shamanistic journey where a low ceiling emits a, a dark cave-like atmosphere. A long horizontal purple wall uh, hides inside additional secret rooms, almost in a grotto style, um, and forces the visitor to explore the space. Somehow this is the moment to reset and reboot our minds, almost as if we are about to be reborn. It sets the stage for the visitors who will need to adjust not only their eyes to the exterior sunlight as they exit the show, but also to mental shifts in how they perceive society moving forward. In the middle of the gallery, there is an artwork which evokes an underwater environment and it's just opposed by a circular blue wall. Here again, we revisit this idea of a circular wall of content, but this time is fully formed and it contains historical paintings of dragon queens from popular Korean mythology. Almost altar-like, they are designed to tune your spirits before you face the city and re-emerge into a, a world ruled by mothers. Um, the studio would like to welcome everyone to join us in this journey, whether physically, virtually, and spirit, spiritually. Um, 
also it would be important to mention that this project has been developed together uh, by Juliana Knoblisch and Finia Kuller, and this animation has been um, developed by and Andrea Belosi. Uh, in general, we would like also to thank the Guangzhou Biennial Foundation for the invitation, and of course, Daphna Ayas and uh, Natasha Ginvala for the immense support they have given. <laughs> So um, I am a, I'm a Portuguese um, architect. I was born and raised in Lisbon. And um, I would say that I was exposed to art quite late um, and actually was through my education. So I was uh, really more invested uh, in understanding the art context while I was studying architecture in college. So um, exhibition design and scenography projects um, is only one type of projects that the studio is currently developing, although it is a good representation of the type of services that we do. I think the reason why we like to do uh, so much this type of uh, project is because they have the incre incredible capacity of being uh, constantly revigorating um, and engaging with new cultures and working with different uh, artists. Well, some alive and some are dead. And also the, this type of project, um, they have a velocity that uh, it's a it's a it's a fast pace, which is something that it's quite complicated to achieve in a, in more conventional um, architectural formats. So. Uh, this is a very uh, complicated question to answer, although it seems quite easy because there's many ways to answer this question. I think the, to answer it the best would be to tell you how the studio normally tries to, 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 to address this issue. So normally we start with a concept and an idea that more than a real space and together with the client we try to figure it out what are the main ideas and experiences for the visitor and what type of atmospheres um, they should be part of the project so initially it's in our minds first of, of course there is a, a a real space that we have to put the project in and most of the times it brings a lot of character and it's a defining element for the whole design uh, but 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 before even putting it in a real space it's as i said it's in our it's it's an idea and it's just inside our mind, our minds for example the the biannual halls has been um, a very it's so characteristic the type of space that we immediately have decided that we wanted to create a very intense and rich environment where the visitors are constantly being stimulated uh, so we wanted to remove the design as much as possible from a white cube art fair warehouse kind of aesthetic <laughs> Working with the Guangzhou Biennial Foundation has been the second uh, opportunity to work in a Korean context. Um, and I'm extremely honored to have this uh, chance again. Um, literally this process started with a research trip to Baekhyangsa Temple, where a large part of the team had the opportunity to meet e each other, to discuss ideas and to, to decide a uh, design direction. This trip not only um, was an unforgettable experience, but it also was incredibly productive, I would say, because we immediately decided what kind of energy we wanted to bring to the project. 
not only in terms of experiences to the vi visitor, but sets, the colors, uh, materials, atmospheres. So I would say that um, this has been like a crucial moment in the design process. And once the, the direction has been decided and defined together, of course, with the whole, with the artistic directors and the curatorial team, it was much easier to develop and detail, detail the project. <laughs> Well, this, this has a huge importance for the artistic directors, uh, Natasha, um, Natasha Gimbala and Daphne Ayers. I mean, we all know that the exhibition halls um, have served as a primary location for the Biennale to happen since 95, which, is, um, which opens actually 15 years uh, after the, the, the violent repression of the Guangzhou uprising. So it is of a huge significance, significance uh, the building and, and, and not only the building, uh, but it's also, uh, it's important towards the city. It reflects a lot of the, the historical um, civic um, struggles that the Guangzhou has faced and also puts it in context with all the, um, the struggles that are happening uh, all over the world. So in terms of design, um, what we try to do is to capture a little bit some of this, th this idea of movement. So we have a lot of moments of congregation, communal interaction, or for example, separation and isola isolation. <laughs> Well, this is a very pragmatic answer. Um, and there are, again, many ways to answer this uh, question. Uh, what we normally do is uh, after the curators have grouped the, um, the artworks by themes or main concepts of the project, what we do is we categorize them and we dif dif differentiate them by types of works. Um, and then what we do is we draw them in an architectural uh, software uh, in scale one-to-one uh, one one, and we try to immediately place them um, in the specific areas where uh, it would make sense for the narrative to happen. Um, what happens many times is that the initial ideas that the curators had about placing certain works at certain moments of the project uh, they don't work because the sizes have not been uh, uh, accommodated in their mindset. So we do have, we start from there and we start revising them uh, step by step in the plans and we move forward in, a, in, in, in that sense. <laughs> I think that the biggest challenge for this specific project was actually how to transform a huge space um, into a visit that feels exciting from the beginning until the end. The biennial halls are divided in two buildings with a total of uh, approximately 8,000 square meters and five floors. So it's a very compartmentalized uh, experience and, um, and of course, we're talking about a, an immense amount of space uh, and of course, artworks. So one thing to, to give you an example, uh, not only to transform the, the visitor experience as almost like a movie score or a meta score, we have decided that um, the ground floor would, would function as a welcome and a social space, almost like in a temple-like uh, atmosphere. And it was completely free uh, it, to the public, which means that you go through the ground floor, you see already what the main themes of the exhibition are, you buy your ticket, and only then, in your mind, you're entering the biennial, because until that moment, you're free to walk around, there's no one 
controlling your tickets or anything. So we somehow uh, have removed uh, conceptually one of the galleries as being inside the, the, the exhibition space. Yeah, as mentioned before, the biggest challenge is actually to remove yourself from this aesthetic of the white warehouse, the white cube, this art fair kind of environment. And um, the research trip was a, was a huge influence and inspiration. Um, and of course, you also have to imagine that this project has been developed by two uh, graphic uh, designer studios, one in Seoul Works and one in the Netherlands with Remco, the, um, that have created this uh, beautiful, colorful monster that populates and inhabits the exhibition. So we had this element, which is the research trip and the experience. And we also have the graphic designers coming up with an identity that was also colorful. So what we decided to do was to create colors and textures, materials, fabrics that somehow would complement um, this ideas already. Um, and, and, and this was somehow the, the starting point. I would almost say that 99% of the artworks are not installed on a, on a white wall. Changes um, happen all the time in, in every project. And the, the, the big challenge is actually how to navigate through them. For example, artists might change their, their artworks uh, with new commissions during the, the whole design. Uh, shipments might not be, uh, can be challenging. And, and for example, materials might not be delivering time. Of course, good planning tries to avoid all of these factors. And the foundation has done an incredible task when it comes to this. And I would like to personally thank Jessica Lim, Lim to, for this and for all the support that she has been giving the studio almost on a daily basis. And on top of this, I think one thing that no one could ever predict was a pandemic um, that forces to rethink how we normally work. I mean, just to give you an example, um, the studio was meant to do to be um, doing a su artistic supervision during construction, and at the time that this was meant to be happening, which was the late November, December, uh, it was impossible for us to travel to Korea. So it meant that we had to transform this whole operation into um, into a digital format. So we have daily phone calls, uh, morning Skypes. Um, uh, documentation, videos um, that somehow help us to be involved. And I think the interesting part is that by doing this, it also allows to share with more people that not, was not necessarily the studio. So for example, the producers, the curators, everyone was immediately involved and could anticipate and prevent issues uh, that, that further on could happen with the installation. Um, of course, this project um, uh, needed a constant adjustment, um, and I and I think the whole team uh, should be uh, very happy of the result of the project. I think it's not the role of the studio to tell how the audience should uh, enjoy the exhibition. So what we can say about this is uh, they, should, it, they should just uh, enjoy it freely. Um, and also to try to experience and capture a little bit the different moments of this um, spatial narrative that we try to offer them.
So the studio is currently working in several projects at the same time in several locations uh, in the world. I can give you uh, just a couple of exa two examples of what we are working uh, at the moment. We are doing for the Van Abe Museum in Heindhoven in the Netherlands. We are um, working on the permanent collection presentation and uh, Next week, we are about to start um, a, a show about techno music, um, uh, framing it uh, socially, economic, com economically, and politically. Uh, and, and this will be presented in Bolzano in Italy. And both projects will be uh, opening towards the end of this year. <laughs> I grew up in front of the water in a, in a country that it's immensely rich by traditional and contemporary architectural examples um, and, and now live in Germany inland. Um, I am not 100% sure uh, how this has influenced the studio's design aesthetics besides the fact that I personally miss it constantly. Just to give you an example, I was there a couple of months ago and after a big storm, I went to the beach um, uh, to photograph all the jellyfish that came, um, that came into the sand. Um, I, 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 I cannot say uh, exactly why I did this, but um, you can, when looking at this kind of scenarios, you can immediately understand that we are a very small part of a whole scheme. Um, and in many ways, I see a, a relationship between it, between this and the Guangzhou Biannual, which is, which is a project uh, with multiple factors. And actually it's a very fragile uh, uh, ecosystem between the dis different agents that are into play. Well, the most memorable, memorable part uh, of this type of project is definitely the people that we get to encounter and we have the, the, the privilege of working with. Um, and, and some of them are for a lifetime. Um, also, another thing that it's quite special for us is to see their reaction of, of how they finally um, fa are faced with a spatial representation of some of their ideas um, and concepts. <laughs> I would suggest to all the students that are touring the, the biannual to get lost in the space and to say hello to our ghosts and to our spirits. <laughs>